Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. A few weeks ago, we visited the Illinois Rural Heritage Museum in Pinckneyville, Illinois, and showed you a few of the exhibits there. Today, we're going to continue that tour with our hosts, Charlie and Mary Greer of Pinckneyville. I've lived within Pinckneyville, 10 miles of Pinckneyville all my life. Uh, my wife, Mary, she was born in Denmark, which is a little settlement outside of Pinckneyville here, which is about 11 miles from town. You both grew up on, a, on farms? We grew up on a farm. Uh, I, had, I have four brothers and sisters. My mother raised us by herself, and we had a dairy farm, and then I switched, uh, when I got, we got married, we switched to hog farm, and now we're retired from farming. We was up to 30, 30 cows. Uh, we just got milking machines to start milking. I become the right age that Uncle Sam wanted me. And my other brothers and sisters was married, so that's when my mother sold out the dairy farm. So there were stamp, you, you would take the milking machines to the cows and stanchions. You didn't have a parlor. Did no, it was, it was in the stanches, the same stanches we used when we hand milked. Yeah. We started out just with raising weaning pigs, and then we went to a feral finish. I'm not sure how many years we had that. It was over 30 years. We had confinement, open confinement barns. Wasn't like the ones now. We had pens with just two or three litters in each pen and raised, sold pigs every month. That's the way we farrowed our sows. We, we, we farmed, we raised corn, we rented. We didn't own enough ground to raise enough corn. We rented ground to raise corn, rotation with corn and beans for the hogs. We uh, had a very large family. I come from a family of 11. We milked cows by hand. Um, I didn't always have to milk because I was kind of a little sickly person that got out of a lot of the chores. We had, uh, our family was very active in 4-H, so I was raised around 4-H projects. A lot of the older equipment, like we have a Husker threader, shredder, Husker shredder, and those people had to be intelligent back then to figure out how to do and build some of these equi this equipment. Um, and nowadays we have the computer, and back then they didn't have a computer, but they still figured out how to put the pieces on and get it to work. We've got a 196 corn binder back here, and the knotter on it that knots and ties a string is very little different than on a hay baler that was built in 1980. And we've got a big Keck and Gutterman thrash machine back here made out of wood between 1895 and 1905. And if you look in the back of the end of it, it looks almost identical to a combine until they come out with a rotor combine. I worked 27 years in the coal mines and farmed every day of it. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. I farmed before and I farmed after. But if you enjoy seeing how our ancestors lived during America's rule yesterday, you're going to love looking at these books. Volume 1 is Fieldwork, showing horses and vintage tractors preparing seed beds, planting, cultivating, and harvesting the crop. Volume 2 shows the work being done in the barn and farmyard. 
feeding and watering the livestock, getting the crop into the barn, milking the cows, shearing the sheep, and collecting the eggs. In volume three, we go inside the home to see the family in the kitchen canning vegetables, in the parlor listening to the radio, and in the dining room for family supper. We also head into town to shop at the general store or visit on the town square on Saturday night. Each book has over 140 large format pages. They sell for $24.95 each, or you can buy two for $44.95, or all three for $54.95 plus shipping. Call 1-877-647-2452 to order. That's 1-877-647-2452. Yeah, uh, Kent Jensen from Siegel, Illinois, owns that. It's double-sided. It's got barbed wire on the other side, too. Actually, these right here are not barbed wire. Earlier, I talked about check planting. Yeah, yeah. These here is what you went in your corn planter to trip it every 42 inches for your check planting. Yeah. I've never seen them that big. I've seen these. Yeah. But I've never seen that. I've got two rolls of check wire back here. The There's a lot of check wire rolls up in the uh, <laughs> in barn in the barns. Yeah. Now okay. there's how they used the planter that I showed you over there earlier. Yep. Now the other two are corn planters too, but the one leaning against the wall is a uh, cotton planter. Okay. It's got a different type of seed uh, extractor inside of it that pushes the cotton seed out because it's fuzzier. But when you put it down like that, it puts the seed down and when you push it, it drops it down in the okay. ground. So it actually pushes and then, it then you step on that, you go 42 inches and do that again. Now they would drag a board or something across the field that has spikes in it that would make these barks. Then, then you followed the row to get your 42 inch widths. We were talking about P&O a while ago. These are both P&O corn planters. Yeah. Now we've got one that's a lot better shape than this. It's all there, but it's down at SIU on display for till May, I think, and then he'll come back. That's why there's items missing here. We took these over to the garden okay. displays. So these never had a fertilizer box? They could have. A secondary box? None, none of ours did, that yeah, we got okay. did. But they could have, and right here, your fertilizer box was set okay. on here, and this was the gear that would have drove it. But most people didn't use fertilizer, they used, used horse or cow manure, and that's all they had. Right. They didn't buy fertilizer. Right. You can tell the older ones had narrower wheels on them. The newer ones had wider wheels. As they progressed, they done changes on them. And that. this part's identical on them, but then they changed and put a wider wheel on it. Yeah. So that was a little bit newer. The Craig Finke that we've got this from, his grandfather used to raise potatoes, eight to 10 acres of potatoes, and sell them over around Belleville and in that area up there. And this is what they used to plow the potatoes out of the ground with. And in the general store, there was a colder deal that goes on a plow to roll the potatoes to the side so you wouldn't cut them. Whenever you got them plowed out, then you could take this and shovel them up. Now I told Craig, Washington County, where he's at, that worked good. Around here, dirt clods was bigger than the potatoes. <laughs> so, but this was to sift the dirt out as you shovel them up, or whenever you shovel them out of the wagon, you use that again, and that got more of the dirt off of them. Yeah. Yeah. This plow here was what they called a new ground sump plow. It's got the attachment on it. When you cleared ground and you was plowing it, you had stumps. Well, if that horse pulled that point underneath the stump, you had to either take the horse loose and pull it backwards if you couldn't pull it by hand. So you put a knife deal on there. It would cut the small roots, but it would keep you from burying it in a stump it would stop wherever it would stop you. Yeah. Huh. The grain drill 
is a John Deere Van Bronck. Rickman Brothers on it. Set up for a tractor tongue, but it would have been that, by horses. That, was really, that tongue should be longer and for horses and whenever they started making tractors, they didn't make equipment. Right. You sawed the tongue out of your horse equipment behind the tractor. So very few horse tongues survived. This here was for drilling oats or wheat between your corn rows, hmm. mainly wheat. Cause back then when you planted the open pollen 120 day corn, you didn't pick corn until December, late November, and December. Well, you wanted your wheat planted in October. Right. So you could go out between the corn rows and drill wheat. Then when you picked your corn, that wheat would be growed up four or five inches high. You could turn the cows loose out there. They would clean up what corn stalks and fodder that was good and could pasture wheat. And then about the end of December, into January, you'd take them off of it and then you'd have your wheat crop for the next year already planted. This here's the biggest walking plow we have on display. But you take a 12 inch walking plow and plow a 40 acre field, which I grant you they never did do that. But how many miles do you think you would have walked plowing a 40 acre field with a 12 inch walking plow? I don't know, I don't know the calculation. From here to American Royal in Kansas City, Missouri, the 333 miles. Actually from here to Chicago, 333 miles. You would have walked 330 miles to plow 40 acres behind a one bottom walking plow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why they didn't have to go to the gymnasiums for exercise. Yeah. 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 Behind us, we've got a John Deere two row corn planter. It's a little bit more modern than some of these ones that just pulled your one row. But, and the gentleman that owned it, whenever he went to switch over, he took the tongue out, put it up in the shed, and put a four before in it for his tractor. Well, his, his granddaughter is the one that got it to fix it back up and paint it, and they put the original tongue back in it then. Nice, nice that they saved it. <laughs> That's really nice. The hay rake, we haven't been able to really date this here, but we're talking like 1850s or earlier. Right. We call it a tumble rake. We ain't found anybody else that knows what it is, for sure, name of it. But when the horses was pulling, it'd be up in the air like that. When it got enough hay in it, it'd push this bar up. You could hook that underneath them two teeth back there with your levers and set these so that it hit the ground and then tumble and dump the hay. The other then you would take and go down your wind rows. It had two horses on it, one on each side. It's hooked on their collar back there what they pulled off of. You take this down your wind row and load it with hay. And then you'd either take it where you're gonna build your haystack or take it to the barn if you slide that seat all the way to the back of that two before and set on it, even loaded with hay, it'd raise this up off the ground about that high. And that's how you transport it. That was your lift on it. This here is a, what we've got of a dairy barn. Mostly everything in here does with dairy. You had your cream separators there. Most people know the upright cream separators. Well, these here was actually cream separators too. You'd put your cream in there, your milk in, and you wanted the cream, but you really didn't care that much about the milk because you had more milk than you need and you couldn't sell the milk, you sold the cream. So you'd mix well water with that. It'd make it colder, make cream separate quicker. And then you could bleed the milk off the bottom of it and you'd have your cream left in there. The other Midwest Dairy Cream Separator over there worked on the same order. This milk can is not actually a milk can. It was a cream separator too. You put your milk in it and it had a hose 
down here that you could drain your milk off the bottom and the cream stayed in the can. How that, would you know when to stop it from flowing? How would you know when, when it's getting to the cream? Uh, it'd just slow down a lot. You'd see the cream come out. Okay. Cause, You'd be paying attention. Well, milk would be pouring out and the cream would start dripping. Because okay. it'd be a lot thicker. Yeah, yeah. And then they come out thinking you had to have your milk pasteurized. Yeah. So this is electric pasteurizer milk for pasteurized milk. And this here tells you what temperatures you bring your milk to for the different diseases that you thought would be in it. Like there's for scarlet fever, diphtheria. Typhoid, yeah, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Yeah. Huh. And this come out of Waterloo, Illinois. If you enjoy seeing how our ancestors lived during America's rule yesterday, you're going to love looking at these books. Volume 1 is fieldwork showing horses and vintage tractors preparing seed beds, planting, cultivating, and harvesting the crop. Volume 2 shows the work being done in the barn and farmyard, feeding and watering the livestock, getting the crop into the barn, milking the cows, shearing the sheep, and collecting the eggs. In Volume 3, we go inside the home to see the family in the kitchen canning vegetables, in the parlor listening to the radio, and in the dining room for family supper. We also head into town to shop at the general store or visit on the town square on Saturday night. Each book has over 140 large format pages. They sell for $24.95 each, or you can buy two for $44.95, or all three for $54.95 plus shipping. Call 1-877-647-2452 to order. That's 1-877-647-2452. What I remember of start milking cows, I'd have been seven, I guess, my sister had been eight. We couldn't reach across to milk a cow. She'd sat on one side, I sat on the other side. We both milked a cow at the same time because I had an older sister that was 12 and brother that was 14 that milked cows by herself. Me and her milked cow with each one milk. We'd milk one cow. Those chains for kicking cows? Yeah, them's kickers. These here locked on the hawk. You put that on the hawk and then you could adjust it tight. So they couldn't kick. Now this other set, I'd never seen a set like them until I got them, and somebody else had to really tell me what they was for. Those are cow kickers too. You put them on the leg and hook the chain, and then they couldn't bend their leg to kick. When we first moved to Swanwick to start our milk herd up there. You take these chains like this, you had your manger, you had a hole drilled in it that you put this through the board so it couldn't pull out. And you put this around the cow's neck. And that's how you would hold the cow in the manger okay. to milk them. Okay. And in the winter time, they stayed in there all night. You left them, you had the chain hooked down low so they could lay down and you kept them in there all night. That was before the stanchion. Then you took them stanchions like that. I can't get to it to open it up, but you'd open up the top, the cows would walk in between these bars and the it, and then you'd sit back here to milk. And it's made so the cow could lay down in it for wherever she's kept in the barn overnight in the winter time. She could get up and down. A lot of stuff run off of coal oil back in the late 18, early 1900s. You could get your a coal oil bucket. Well, some people had a coal oil can. You take this to town and have it filled with coal oil. And then it'd lock up. You take this down and pour it out into your lamps or into your heaters and that. I can remember trying to fill burners for hogs with a funnel about a half hour before I was supposed to catch a school bus, <laughs> pouring it and have coal all over your shoes. <laughs> but nobody complained. Right. 
or Bob, you probably there's two bus, two, two two people back had the same thing. Yeah. Chicken brooder, you filled this full of coal, and it had a burner underneath there, yeah. and it's got a little biscuit sensor there that regulated to, to keep the temperature right for little chickens. The incubator, it fired with coal oil, but the top tank was water. The coal oil heated the water, which heated the eggs, and put the moisture in there. And it's got a deal on it that if it gets so hot, it'd shut down so the coal oil fire couldn't come up through it to regulate the temperature. This here was for shredding grapes or crushing apples that before you would squeeze the juice out for apple cider. And, that, and that's what this here was for. Some of your cider presses, little ones like the one we have back there don't have a grinder with it. Okay. So you had to grind it here to, so you could squeeze the juice out of it better. This here's an ash sifter. And what I understand now, if you want to make homemade soap, you need to know how to use this. We use a screen wire, but you put your wood ashes in here and turn that, and it uh, sifted the charcoal chunks and that out of your wood ashes. Okay, you had a barrel, wooden barrel. I don't know, grandma's was about that big around, about that tall. There was a sleeve. You had crossbars in the bottom of it, and you'd put leaves on top of that, then you put your wood ashes in on that, and you let water drip through that. And when that water come out the bottom, it was lye. And that's how they made lye water. If you got it down far enough, you can make lye soap out of it. Use it to mix with your lard to make lye soap. Otherwise, they used a lot of that lye water for washing clothes in. That's why Grandpa's blue jeans was always white instead of blue, because of lye water. But this tells a step on how to make lye soap. Well, I understand you can't buy lye now because it's a hazardous chemical and you can't buy it no more okay. in the last five to ten years. This is actual lye soap made out of lye and hog lard. Okay. Hmm. This is actual lye soap made out of lye and hog lard. Okay. Hmm. This buggy here is a Veely buggy. John Deere, the started the John Deere Tractor Company. His granddaughter, or his daughter, his youngest daughter married a Veely. Their youngest son started a Veely Buggy Company. They built Veely buggies, Veely tractors, and Veely cars. There's one Veely car known to exist yet huh. up northern <coughs> Wisconsin, somewhere up in there. But nobody knows of a Veely tractor, and there's very few Veely buggies. Huh because he it was just a more of a hobby business that he great granddaughter great grandson of uh, john deere didn't need the money he just needed something to do but if you had your buggy or even a wagon if you wanted to work on a wheel like grease them or something you take your jack and put it underneath there you could raise it up you can take your wheel off and grease it or whatever you want or two on it and this is original jack, it's not a remake, it's original. Uh -huh. Now the lantern. Be sure to tune in next week for the final installment of our three-part series on the Illinois Rural Heritage Museum. Even then, we won't have shown you everything the museum has to offer. It's truly a complete portrayal of life years ago in rural America. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. 
or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.